Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining this OIST Foundation webinar. Uh, as we wait for the over 100 people that are joining us, I would like to engage the audience in a few uh, simple questions just to get a sense of uh, who you are and what you're interested in. And the first uh, question that we're always quite interested in is knowing where you are joining us from. Uh, and I have a couple of options here, the United States, uh, Okinawa, Japan, uh, other parts of Japan, Germany, since our speaker tonight is calling in from Germany, I thought it might be interesting to see if, if anyone is awake at uh, 1230 in the morning to join. Uh, and if you're outside of the US and Japan or Germany, uh, please write in the chat uh, where you're calling in from. And right now we have a nice mix. We have 54% uh, from the United States, 29% from Japan, uh, sorry, from Okinawa, 11% from other parts of Japan, uh, and 11% calling in from other countries. I'm going to end this poll, I'll quickly share uh, this data, uh, and people are uh, starting to join the webinar now, so we're uh, over 50 people at the moment. And let me share a second question with everyone. Uh, this is just a question regarding your interests in tonight's webinar. Uh, are you interested in how uh, Neanderthal DNA contributed to the DNA of modern humans, the history of Denisovians and Neanderthals, the process by which ancient DNA is extracted, how Neanderthal gene variants may impact responses to COVID-19, uh, Dr. Pablo's background and biography or other topics which you can write in into chat. Uh, so thank you all for participating in this. I'll share uh, these results. We have someone who's dialing in from Italy who just wrote that in the chat. Uh, majority of people interested in how Neanderthal DNA contributed to the DNA of modern humans and next the history of Denisovians and Neanderthals, but a good mix of people interested in a number of topics. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, wish everyone a good evening and a good morning if you're calling from Japan and good middle of the night if you're in uh, Europe. I'm David James with the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University in Okinawa, Japan and the OIST Foundation based in the United States. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us for this sixth U.S.-Japan Science Webinar. Uh, tonight's is titled The Neanderthals in Us, How Neanderthal Genes Influence Us Today. And this is a presentation and discussion by Dr. Svante Pabo, who is director of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology and an adjunct professor at OIST. And I'll introduce him in a moment. I am very uh, thankful that he is willing to join us uh, live from Germany, where it is uh, 1230 in the morning. So thank you for that. Uh, for those who don't know, since some of you may be new, OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, is an interdisciplinary graduate school that offers a five-year PhD in science. The main task of OIST is to produce groundbreaking, cutting-edge research for the benefit of all humankind. And the OIST Foundation in the United States support scientific breakthroughs, innovation, and the sustainable development of Okinawa through OIST. I would like to let everybody know that we very much welcome your participation tonight. You can write questions in the chat or the Q&A, and uh, later on in the, in the presentation, uh, we'll have some time, uh, and I'll try to weave those in. Also, tonight's uh, webinar is being recorded and is on the record. Let me introduce Dr. Svante Pabo. Again, thank you for joining us uh, so early in the morning uh, from Leipzig. Uh, Dr. Svante Pabo is an evolutionary geneticist. He has developed techniques that allow DNA sequences from archeological and paleontological remains to be determined. This has allowed ancient DNA from extinct organisms, humans, animals, and pathogens to be studied. His research group has determined high quality Neanderthal genome sequences, allowing for the reconstruction of the recent evolutionary history of our species and the realization that Neanderthals contributed DNA to present day humans. By studying DNA sequences from a small Siberian bone, Pablo discovered Denisovians, a previously unknown hominin group distantly related to Neanderthals. 
Pabo also works on the comparative and functional genomics, genomics of humans, Neanderthals, and apes, particularly the evolution of genetic features that may underlie aspects of traits specific to humans. In 2014, Professor Pabo published a book titled Neanderthal Man in Search of Lost Genomes. And this year, congratulations uh, to you, he won the Japan Prize. He's a Japan Prize laureate. And in 2016, uh, was awarded the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. Uh, since May 2020, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Pabo has been an adjunct professor at OIST. We are so honored to have him uh, at OIST and deeply honored to have you with us tonight. I'll turn it over to you uh, for your talk. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, David. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, and talk to you. Uh, I have this slide, uh, first slide, that is a model of OIST. And I guess it's a model just to symbolize the sad fact that at the moment I'm not able to come to OIST. I haven't been there since January this year. I certainly hope that it will be possible to travel very soon again to come there. So what I then wanted to talk to you about, you should see if uh, here, is sort of the origin of modern humans and how modern humans interacted with the other humans that were around early during our history. And as an introduction, then I would just want to remind you about the fact that modern humans, the direct ancestors and of everyone alive today, evolved in Africa. And then sometimes after 100,000 years ago, more 60, 70,000 years ago, modern humans starting spreading seriously out of Africa into Asia and Europe. But the interesting thing is that we were not the only form of humans around at that time. There were other forms of humans that existed and had existed already for hundreds of thousands of years. Most famously then Neanderthals in Western Eurasia and in Eastern Eurasia, their distant relatives, their cousins, if you like, the Denisovans. So our lab is then sort of fascinated or obsessed, if you like, with Neanderthals and Denisovans since many years. And you may then ask, why should you as a biologist be interested in these extinct forms of humans? And I think there are at least two reasons for that. One is in a way that they are the closest evolutionary relatives of everyone alive today. So if you want to sort of define humans as a group or as a species, it's really them we should compare ourselves to and say, in what sense are we similar to them and in what sense are we different from them? Another interesting thing is also that they were here until quite recently. We think that about 40,000 years ago, the last Neanderthals and Denisovans became extinct. So just something in the order of 1300, 1400 generations ago, they were still here. So the question becomes, how are we related to them? How did we interact with them? Did we mix with them and so on? But to then ask those questions in a sort of rigorous, if you like, uh, biological way, you need to study their genomes, their DNA, their genetic material. And something that my lab has then worked on over the last 30 years actually is work out techniques to do that because there are a lot of technical issues with this. And one is, the first one is, of course, that if you compare nice fresh DNA that you would extract from, say, a blood sample of me today, and compare it to the DNA you would extract from a 40,000-year-old bone or older bone, the first thing is that there's a lot less there of it, often 100,000-fold, a million-fold less. Not only that, it's degraded, these long, nice DNA molecules are degraded to short little pieces that are in addition carry chemical modifications that may confuse you when you study uh, uh, DNA sequences. And in addition, the vast majority of the DNA in such an old bone is of course not endogenous, it's not from the Neanderthals, it's from 
uh, fungi and from bacteria that colonized this bone during tens of thousands of years when it was buried in the ground. So because it's so little there, it's also the fact that even tiny contaminations in your experiments or of the bone from DNA from present day people may, may sort of confuse your results. So all these things we sort of worked on over many years. So what you then do is you isolate these short molecules that are similar to the Neanderthal genome. You take into account these chemical modifications and you map them to the human genome and then reconstruct what the Neanderthal or the Nisovan genome would have looked like. So we are now in the lucky situation that we've been able to determine three quite complete Neanderthal genomes to high quality. The quality is actually similar to a genome you would sequence from a present day person, one from Europe, two from southern Siberia here. And from this area, there is also this Denisovan genome of the Asian relatives. There. And one interesting thing that have come out from comparing these genomes to present day genomes is this realization that when modern humans spread out of Africa, starting to do that then around 70,000 years ago, they met Neanderthals early on, probably already in the Middle East, and they at that time mixed with them. So there were babies produced, and those babies were successful enough to become integrated in the modern human societies and in turn contribute their DNA to later generations. And their descendants then carried that out into the rest of the world. So the result of that is that if your genetic roots are outside Sub-Saharan Africa, something like one or two percent of your entire DNA comes from these Neanderthals. So if we look a little more in detail on that, looking at the Neanderthal genetic contributions on just one chromosome, chromosome nine, in a number of individuals here. So each line would be one chromosome nine from one individual. And we mark in red the regions of these chromosomes that come from Neanderthals. You will see that different people carry often different pieces of the Neanderthal genome. But on average, in a person that adds up to one or two percent. But this also means that if you add up these different segments from different individuals, if you jump from individual to individual, so to say, you can sum up larger sections of the Neanderthal genome. So if you look in a few thousand people, something like 40 or 50 percent of the Neanderthal genome still exists in people today and walk around on, on two legs, so to say. But there is not only this contribution then from Neanderthals. We find in Asia also a contribution from Denisovans, quite a small contribution in mainland Asia, about 10 times less than the Neanderthal contribution, something like 0.2% on top of the Neanderthal contribution. But in Oceania, quite interestingly, say in Papua New Guinea, Aboriginal Australians, something like 5% of the genome comes from Denisovans. So something like 7% if you add on the Neanderthal contribution. So just to sum up sort of what we think then, we know about the history of Neanderthals, Denisovans and modern humans from studying their genome is that the ancestor of Neanderthals and Denisovans probably lived in Africa more than half a million years ago, came out of Africa then much earlier than the modern humans and evolved in Western Eurasia to what we call Neanderthals and in Eastern Eurasia to what we call Denisovans. We don't quite know where the border of these groups have been, but say in Southern Siberia at some point there have been Neanderthals, at other times there have been Denisovans. Then modern humans come out of Africa mix early on with Neanderthals. We now know that they mixed also later on at other po points with Neanderthals. And in the East, they mix with Denisovans also several times. And they also, of course, come out to regions of the world where Neanderthals and Denisovans never went, to Oceania, for example, or to the Americas. And Eventually, these other forms of humans become extinct 
but live on a little bit then in the form of this genetic contributions in people outside Africa. So what I then wanted to discuss with you today are three projects actually that are very recent in our labs. Two of them were published this year, one is not yet published, that will illustrate the biological contributions and what effects they have in people who live today. And it will illustrate also, I think, that these contributions can be both positive and negative influences to us today. So the first example of this then involves something, all these examples involve things that evolved in Neanderthals and came over then to a small extent or bigger extent to present day humans. So what we then want to study are the effects in modern humans and we might be able to sort of also draw, draw inferences of the effects of these things in Neanderthals, about Neanderthal physiology. So in some sense, if you like, we may use modern humans as a model organism to study Neanderthal variants in, in present day people. So the very first example I wanted to uh, discuss involves the gene encoding the progesterone receptor. So progesterone is an enzyme that's particularly important during pregnancy to maintain pregnancy. And it, if we look where this Neanderthal variant exists, it has this typical pattern where it is not seen in Africa because there were no Neanderthals there. You find it outside Africa and particularly in up to 20% or so in people in Europe. And already before one knew that this variant came from Neanderthals, it had been quite studied because it turned out that it has turned out that this variant is associated with preterm births, so having premature kids which is of course a bad thing because quite a few of these kids may die, particularly in more traditional uh, times or traditional societies. So when it was realized that this came from Neanderthals, people speculated that that should have been very bad for Neanderthals, would have been a selective disadvantage for them having more premature kids. But what we can now also do, which is quite interesting I think is that we sorry I was uh, I have to go here and there ah oh, sorry 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 ah. uh, I there and this is what I need to do um, what we can do is to look for genetic variants from Neanderthals in the skeletons of modern humans over time because we now begin to have actually thousands of genomes from modern humans from different periods that archaeologists have found and where people have retrieved their DNA. So we can begin to ask how frequent were such Neanderthal variants over time. So here is then a map where the red dots are these are uh, Neanderthal Denisovan genomes. Here are marked in gray genomes that are about 15,000 years old gray when they don't have Neanderthal variant and black when they do carry it. And now we can follow in a little animation here over time, walking, becoming more and more recent towards present day time. And you will see that not much change, but when we come to 7,000 years ago or so, this variant begins to explode and become very, very frequent in Europe. So this is of course very strange. Why would something that results in preterm birth increase in frequency like this. So this seemed very strange to us. So uh, we went and looked in a big cohort study in the UK, the biggest one that is around several hundred thousand people from which one has genetic information and have medical information and where they also answered a lot of questionnaires about their life and, and their medical history. So if we look there, on associations among these people in Britain with the modern allele, the non-Neanderthal-like alleles. So we've, then we find that that allele is actually, that variant is associated with bleeding early in pregnancy. It's associated with early miscarriages and it's negatively associated here with the number of sisters and actually also brothers, so the number of siblings you have. 
So if you have the modern non-Neanderthal variants, you are bleeding early in pregnancy, more miscarriages, and fewer siblings. So this is quite the opposite to what one thought, in other words. So the Neanderthal variant here is associated with preterm birth, that's correct, but it is also protective against miscarriages and results in more live births. So what we think goes on is that this Neanderthal variant actually saves pregnancies that would otherwise have resulted in miscarriages. So they are result in live births, but the price you pay, so to say, is that some of these babies are premature. But that still results in more live births in the end. And we also begin to think that we know why this is the case. Because if we look at how much of this receptor people carry on their cell surface in different tissues, then we find that people that carry the Neanderthal variant have more of this receptor. So that then suggests that you're more sensitive to this hormone because you have more receptors for it. And quite interesting in this year there have now been two studies appeared where people mimic the Neanderthal condition, so to say, by giving progesterone to people, to women during pregnancy, if they have previous miscarriages. So this is one study where you give progesterone to women that have one, two, or three or more previous miscarriages, and you find that this results in more live births, up to 14% more live births. So this is then an example of a very positive effect, we would say, of a Neanderthal variant in present-day people. So the other example I wanted to bring is then something that we thought existed only in Neanderthals and not in modern humans. And that involves another cell surface protein, this time an ion channel that sits in the cell membrane. And it carries actually three amino acid differences in the Neanderthals when you compare it to modern humans and to other organisms. And the person that notices that I should mention is Hugo Seder, who's very instrumental in all these studies I present here today. So this is one of the most different proteins that the Neanderthal carried relative to modern humans. And this is an interesting protein because it's actually the ion channel that sits in the peripheral nerve endings in all your nerves that sense pain and initiate the sense of pain that is then transported, of course, up to the brain via the spinal cord and so on. So uh, we were very interested in this receptor. So we expressed the Neanderthal version of this protein here in red and compared it to the modern human one in blue in experiment where you stimulate it electrically and see how much current is left through the cell membrane. And you then find that the Neanderthal variant sort of for a certain stimulation seem to let through more current as if it was more sensitive. And you can also show that that is due to that it has a slower inactivation. So once it's open, it has a bigger probability to remain open for a long time. And you can show that this is due to two of these amino acid changes that sit intracellularly in the protein and the third one doesn't seem to influence this. So that then stimulated us to go back to the UK biobank again and see if it after all exists in present day humans. And we're very lucky to see that among 360,000 people, there were actually a small fraction, 0.4%, does carry a version, the Neanderthal version, in one copy. So we could then look in the questionnaires these people had answered for all the questions that had to do with pain. So any form of pain now, say stomach pain, back pain, headaches, and so on. There were 16 such questions. And for me, it was the first time I had a chance to sort of play with such big uh, sort of uh, epidemiological data. So I was very curious what the most uh, strong association was, and quite sadly, I should say, as I now get older, the biggest association with much, how much pain 
you report in your life is age. The older you get, the more pain you have. And it's trivial in a way, the older you get, the more medical issues you have. We can also start sort of asking politically incorrect questions. We can ask, do men or women report more pain in their lives? Uh, we have quite big power to answer the question. Hundreds of thousands of people have answered this. And I'm very happy to report that we actually luckily see no difference in that at all. But more relevant for what we discuss then, if we look at the people that carry the Neanderthal version, these three amino acid changes here, they do report more pain in their lives. So if we should sort of relate this to this age effect, if you carry one copy of this inherited from one of your parents, it is as if you were eight years older in terms of how much pain you report in your life. Of course, one should say that we don't know if the Neanderthals experience more pain because this pain sensation is, of course, not only dependent on what is elicited in your nerve endings, it's modulated in your spinal cord and very much so in your brain. We all know that the same sort of stimulus can sometimes feel very painful and sometimes much less so depending on your mood or, or your state. But of course, these people that say they experience more pain here, they, they carry one copy only. Neanderthals had both their copies in this state. So it's very tempting to sort of say that perhaps we need to reconsider our sort of view of Neanderthals as brutish and insensitive. Perhaps they were actually wimps and very sensitive and everything was a pain to them when modern humans appeared. So the third thing I then want to discuss with you involves the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, that is on all our minds, I guess. Um, I just looked today on the World Health Organization uh, webpage and we are approaching one million uh, uh, deaths now just in these days. So, as you also know, most people who are infected with this virus have very mild symptoms or even no symptoms at all. A minority become severely ill, some become critically ill and needs to be in intensive care and have mechanical ventilation, and, and quite a few uh, then die from this. You also know, I think, that the biggest risk factor for becoming severely ill and dying is age. The older you are, the more likely you are to die. There are other uh, risk factors too, uh, diabetes and etc. But all these risk factors then don't completely explain or fully explain why some people become severely ill and others not severely ill or even have no symptoms at all. So there's been quite an interest in also looking for genetic factors, so factors in the hosts, in the humans. So there is a big consortium of uh, groups around the world that have contributed. It's, uh, it's coordinated uh, from Finland, Mark Davis, uh, who coordinates this, where different centers have then contributed their clinical data and genetic data for their patients. And one then looks for associations we're becoming severely ill uh, in these individuals. And when you do that and go over the genome across each chromosome listed here, and each dot is a genetic marker, you will see that one region stands out dramatically here on chromosome three. So this is of course quite interesting. And in terms of such genetic association studies, it's quite a strong signal. There is another smaller study that appeared a little earlier that also saw this signal. They saw also a signal for the ABO blood groups here that you may have heard about, that blood group A would be a particular risk factor. There was just the other week a big study from 23andMe where they then asked a million people uh, about their, uh, if they had been sick or hospitalized and so on. They see both these signals. But if they, they see the signal on the blood group, particularly for people, just if you ask, have you tested positive for the virus? If you look for having severe respiratory sy symptoms, 
it's the signal on three and nothing here for the blood groups. So although this may change, this is changing very rapidly, what we know about this, it seems that susceptibility to be infected by the virus is affected by these blood groups, but if you become severely ill or not, it's this locus on uh, chromosome three. So we're very interested in this locus. So we zoom in on this region here on chromosome three. Each dot is a genetic marker again. And when it is marked as red here, the risk allele matches the Neanderthal genome. So you will see that there are red dots here, particularly where the risk is very high. The higher it is here, the higher the association with the risk. So if we sort of do a tree of relatedness of this region on the chromosome and mark each each number, Roman number here, is a genetic variant in present-day people. In the red box are the ones associated with the risk. And here are the Neanderthal genomes. So you will see that the Neanderthal genome here from Europe is closely related to these risk alleles here. You do this for all the variants in a much bigger set, present-day people again. Here's the Neanderthal genome. Here are all the guys with the risk. So this shows very clearly that this Neanderthal version here came over to modern humans in the past and then exists in some people today. And interestingly, it varies a lot across the world. So it has this pattern that you now know well, it's not in Africa. In Europe, about 16% of people carry risk, risk, risk variant. In South Asia, it's very high, about 50%. Bangladesh is the highest we know about. 65% of people there carry at least one copy of this risk variant. In East Asia, interestingly, it's almost absent. So one thing one can say, this pattern here of seeing something that is very common here and next door in East Asia is absent, really suggests that this has been positively selected in the past, that this variant had had some positive effect in South Asia. We've speculated about cholera, for example. Uh, so there are some reasons to speculate about that here, that it could have been protective for that. Uh, but what we are now particularly interested in is, of course, to look in this region that most highly associated with risk here at the genes that sit there. So there are three genes in there that are partially or fully in that region. The, Gene products they encode, the proteins that encode, have no difference between the Neanderthals and, and uh, the modern humans. So it's probably about how strongly or where these genes are expressed. And you can sort of speculate this gene has something to do with immune defense and is expressed on immune cells. This actually associates uh, with the receptor for the virus. So we and others are now very actively uh, looking into this, particularly in these days. But to then sum up and end up this then, what could they say that uh, this variant that comes from Neanderthals is the strong risk factor for becoming severely ill. Age is still the strongest factor, but after that, carrying this variant is the strongest risk. So if you're homozygous for it, if you inherited this Neanderthal variant on chromosome 3, both from your mother and your father, if you translate that to age, it is as about as if you were 20 years older in terms of your risk to become severely ill or die from, from the infection. We can also calculate from the frequency and the relative risk approximately for how many extra deaths the Neanderthal variant is responsible in the pandemic. And it's in the order of to date about 100,000, about 10% of the deaths are uh, due to this. But interestingly then, it seems to have had positive effects in the past in, in South Asia, for example. So with that, I should end. I should say that what I described is then done both in, in Leipzig, in Germany, at the Max Planck Institute here, and increasingly, uh, as we're able to move there, 
uh, also at OIST in Okinawa. And with that, I then thank you for your attention. Well, Dr. Pavel, that was outstanding, and thank you so much. There are a broad array of questions that have come in, and I think uh, I'll jump in, if it's okay with you, to some of those, and, uh, and then I'll go back to a few uh, questions that I myself have. And to kind of start where you uh, ended with COVID-19, we have one question which I'll read. Uh, with regards to COVID-19, the mortality rate in Africa is surprisingly low and the symptoms among the infected are not as severe. In Europe and in much of the rest of the world, the mortality rate has been high. Could this difference due to inherited, be due to inherited factors from the Neanderthals? Could Africa have a variant uh, that protects them from severe COVID-19 uh, effects? Yes, I think what one can say is that this genetic risk factor uh, is not there in Africa. So from that perspective, Africans would be better off. There are, of course, many other factors that influence this that really doesn't translate directly. There are also many socioeconomic factors in terms of how densely you live together and interact with other people. A very strong factor when you look at mortality in different countries is also how old your population is. So in parts of the world where the population is very young, I will close the window, there are, um, uh, in parts of the world where the population is very young, you have less deaths happening. And in parts of the world where the population is older, you have more. And that is sort of a very big factor also. So, so it's from a genetic perspective, that is right. But there are many other things that influence this also. Uh, and uh, another individual writes, uh, what are some of the current operational hypotheses for the protective factors for these Neanderthal variants in some regions? Yes, so I think one idea about why one becomes severely ill, needs ventilation and may die from this, is an overreaction of the immune system, actually. Mm -hmm. That you have something they are sometimes called a cytokine storm, that you have a sort of infiltration of inflammatory of immune cells and inflammation in, in your lungs. From that perspective, one of those genes is interesting that sits in there, CCR9. It has been studied in the past in terms of inflammatory uh, bowel disease. Um, so it could be that that gene is, is involved in that. That's one of the things we're sort of pursuing one of the other genes there, as I hinted at, sits in a complex with the protein ACE2, which is a receptor for the virus. It may be that it influences how much of the receptor you have on the cell surface. That's sort of another idea. It may even be that both things are correct and that this is somehow a perfect storm in that two bad things come together in this region. But no one knows that at the moment. Thank you for that. There, there are a few questions related to uh, your uh, discussion about um, premature babies and uh, progesterone. Um, let, let me read both of them. And so one individual writes, uh, how do we know if Neanderthals had premature babies or just shorter pregnancies? Uh, the other person um, is, wanting a bit of, bit more uh, information about how Neanderthal variant uh, AV660L is both promoting and protecting uh, miscarriages. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. so, so yes, I think the first question then, how do we know that Neanderthals had more uh, less premature babies, or had more pr premature babies and less miscarriages. We don't really know that, one should say. It is, of course, this, uh, the situation that many other variants that Neanderthal carries may also influence this. 
So we don't really know that also like for the pain. There could be other variants in the Neanderthal genome that influence this. Um, there is some indication, I don't think, although I'm not an expert on that, that one really knows if there was a difference in the length of pregnancy. Uh, there is some indication, I think, that, that Neanderthal babies sort of had a bit different cranial morphology, for example, when they were born. Um, but it could be some kind of adaptation to birth or, or pregnancy that we don't understand. And what we can study is just their effects in present-day people. Uh, the other question was, and if we know a bit more physiologically about these things, and actually we, we don't know more than what I said, uh, as far as I know, we are of course not directly studying this. We, we can show that people who carry the Neanderthal version of this progesterone receptor express higher levels of it. It's then very reasonable to think that one is more sensitive to the same levels of the hormone and that that would sort of maintain pregnancies. And it's very reassuring or sort of fulfilling to see that when one now gives progesterone to women who are at risk of miscarriages, it actually has the effect of sort of carrying more, more kids to term. So it sort of all fits together physiologically, but the exact mechanisms are actually not only that amino acid change, they're also sort of change in the Neanderthal variant with an insertion of a mobile element there that might affect the expression of the gene, for example. So that we don't know exactly why it's higher expressed uh, even, actually. Very interesting. Uh, one question uh, several people are, are interested in uh, really goes back to a, a comment you made early on about the difference between extracting DNA from, say, a blood sample uh, versus ancient DNA, where uh, you know, you're getting a very small uh, percentage of the DNA. What's, could you just describe what the process is like or the procedure? How do you extract uh, ancient DNA? Yes. So, well, first of all, we work in sort of clean room conditions to do this, to avoid contamination from present day DNA. Mm. We, we generally remove the surface of the bone and take a sample inside. And this is generally very small samples. It's like 20, 30, 40 milligrams. So it's sort of, you use a dentist to drill, to drill a small little hole. And then this bone powder, you solubilize. So you lose, uh, much of the bone is made out of hydroxyapatite that you can then dissolve with radians that bind the calcium away. So you, and then you digest away the proteins that are also there. And then you have uh, your fats and nucleic acid in solution, and you bind it to silica particles that bind DNA specifically. You can wash that and then elute it, and then you have your DNA extract. But you have very little of the DNA you're interested in. So what you then do is ligate on, on the ends, synthetic little pieces of DNA on the ends of your ancient DNA molecules. So you can then use that to amplify it by this polymerase chain reaction, make many copies of it, and then sequence it further. Thank you very much for explaining that. Uh, we, I think at some point we'd love to do a virtual tour of your lab. <laughs> One could do that, actually. <laughs> uh, let me add, go, go back to a few uh, other questions that have come in. There is one question about how Neanderthal DNA contributes to diseases, uh, you know, in the, the sort of response to diseases other than COVID-19. I, I think in some ways you, you, you covered that, but are there any other comments uh, in regard to other diseases that uh, Neanderthal DNA? Yes, has? there are other uh, interesting things. There's, there are receptors on the immune cells, toll-like receptors that are involved in what you call innate immunity. So sort of the first immune response you have when viruses or bacteria in, invade your body. 
not the antibodies that you develop all, over time. Uh, and those variants are associated, the Neanderthal variants are associated with uh, less risk for ulcers when you have a Helicobacter pylori infection. Ulcers are generally caused by this bacterium. Uh, but not everyone with the bacteria get an ulcer. And this variant sort of helps to protect you against developing the ulcers. If you don't have an ulcer, you may thank the Neanderthals. But it's also an example, I think, about that a genetic variant may have both positive and negative effects. So the very same variant that protects you against these ulcers are also increase your risk for the allergic problems. So if that allergies, you may perhaps blame the Neanderthals for that. And I think it's sort of very much a lesson there to be learned that a genetic variant is often very hard to say, is it bad or is it good? You know, we would all say that this Neanderthal variant on chromosome three that makes us more susceptible to get very sick and die from coronavirus is very, very bad, and it is. But I think it's clear evidence that in South Asia at some point it has been positive. Otherwise, 50% of people there would not carry this today. Can't win everything. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Uh, there is a, a good question here about what you plan to do at OIST. Uh, so uh, the question is, what kind of project are you planning to conduct at OIST? And are there any plans to work on Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestry uh, in modern Japanese? In, in yes, yes, actually, there are two things. I mean, apart from that, OIST is the most amazing scientific environment uh, and the really stimulating place to be intellectually. One other reason is actually that we would be very interested in studying contribution from Denisovans to present day people. You know, in Europe and with the UK cohort and other cohorts, we have a Neanderthal contribution we can study and I've shown you examples of that. What you have in Japan that we don't have in Europe is in addition a contribution from Denisovans. So we are very interested in working together with uh, Biobank Japan, for example, to try to look at similar things, what is contributed, similar approaches, what is contributed from the Nisivans to present day people in Asia, and particularly Japan. And I think there are some early indications that there might be interesting things here. It doesn't come from Japan, but from studies in Tibet. There is, as you may know, uh, people in Tibet are sort of adapted to living at high altitudes where there's little oxygen in the atmosphere. And that's a sort of specific adaptation in that population. If other people move to Tibet, you also adapt, but you do that by producing more red blood cells. And that has downsides. Your blood is thicker, if you like, it's easier to clot. So you have more problems with clotting diseases, particularly in, in pregnancies. But Tibetans have some other form of adaptation that allows them to absorb more oxygen without this extra red blood cells. And the group at Berkeley have found when they compared the Denisovan genome with sequence to the genomes of Tibetans, that in a, re, in a gene called EPAS1 there, that's associated with this adaptation, comes from Denisovans. And around 80% of uh, people in Tibet carry that today. So there are clearly been contributions from uh, Denisovans that are of interest. And one big hope and OIST is that we should be able to address those things. That is sort of one direction of it. The other direction uh, that I want to work on in OIST is the flip side in a way of what I talked to you about today. In some sense, I'm very interested in what Neanderthals and Denisovans did not contribute to present day humans. What defines really modern humans when you compare to them. There are in fact around seven 
big regions in the modern human genome where we find no contribution from Neanderthals, although statistically we would expect it. And then we sequence people genomes from Melanesia to look at the Denisovan contribution and find that the same regions there also do not accept Denisovan contributions. So you have very good indication that these regions contain something that's really positively selected in modern humans. When these other forms contribute there, it's selected away. So in some sense, there must be things in there, we believe, that sort of defines us as modern humans. Now, this is quite difficult to look at. These are big regions. They contain many, many genes. But we can, of course, look in these regions and look for things that are tempting to speculate that there are differences in an encoded protein or some rearrangement or something that's of interest. So that's the other thing I want to study at OIST, where we will make mouse models for some of these changes, where we will humanize and neanderthalize or denisovanize mice and compare their physiology. We will also use new techniques, CRISPR-Cas9, to introduce changes in human stem cells to the Neanderthal or Denisovan state in these genes, and then differentiate these stem cells to, say, nerve cells or liver cells and study their physiology. So this is sort of high-risk, high-stakes projects. So the dream, in some sense, would be to understand what made modern humans special relative to Neanderthals and Denisovans. There's after all some reason that modern humans and not Neanderthals and not Denisovans went from becoming, say, being a few hundred thousand numbers to becoming millions and billions spread across the whole world, et cetera, et cetera. Those are gonna... That is sort of a dream that probably goes beyond my lifetime, but perhaps make a start or find aspects of that. What, what exciting projects. Th those are going to be incredibly exciting at, at OIST. I, I wonder if you could talk uh, just a little bit about the intersection of the kind of research that you're doing and, and the future of medicine. Uh, do, you, do you see that uh, you know, the medical field will use uh, genetics in an increasing way to uh, try to determine how people might react to certain uh, diseases as you, uh, you know, continue to find out more information? I mean, in general, that is certainly the case. You know, we talk about precision medicine, personalized medicine, mm -hmm. and what that is, is that you would sort of study what genetic variants you carry and maybe tailor the therapy for that. And in some sense, these contributions, genetic contributions from extinct forms of humans is just one other source of genetic variation in our genome. It may be, in some sense, interesting relative, if you compare to just random mutations in that these are, after all, variants that were functional and were selected over hundreds of thousands of years in another group. They now come into humans, so they tend to be functional, but perhaps function in a slightly different way and therefore perhaps live on and have, have consequences. So um, I don't know it's, uh, what was more exactly the question you were after. You know, I think that, for example, now in the COVID case here, seeing these risks alleles and trying to understand what they do may really help you to design a therapy. If we can understand why I become severely sick and another one of the same age or other similar to me does not become severely sick when we are infected, if we know what genes are involved in that, we might be sort of able to go in with some therapy. Mm. There is indication that these two genes I stressed there are higher expressed from the Neanderthal version than from the modern human versions. It may be that what we should do is sort of inhibit this, these genes in some form with a small molecule or something like that. So there might be things coming out of this. 
Very interesting. But of course, our research, I should also say, is curiosity driven. I mean, we are interested in this. It's incredibly fun to study. And now, of course, in the last since, since uh, June here, it has taken on a very serious aspect in that we sort of really devote our attention to the COVID thing because it's so, so important. There are uh, a broad array of very detailed questions coming in, but we, we only have about five minutes left. So I think with many of those, I will um, share them with you later and uh, see if we can get a response. Let me ask you uh, just a kind of fun question. How did you get interested in this field? Uh, you mentioned it's curiosity driven. You're clearly so passionate about it. What, what first led you to this? Well, I think my history is a bit that as many kids, I was fascinated by archeology span and particularly Egyptology. Mm -hmm. My mother took me to Egypt when I was 14, I think. And that was really transformative experience. I then really wanted to become an archaeologist and started studying Egyptology at the university and found out I have a too romantic idea about it. It was about studying ancient hieroglyphics and grammar and I sort of didn't know what to do. And I ended up studying medicine because I didn't know what to do with my life. But then the molecular biology revolution came around. I realized there were thousands and thousands of mummies in Egyptological collections and no one seemed to try to extract DNA from them. So I sort of then started to combine these things, molecular biology with archaeology and sort of brought these interests together in a very lucky way, in a sense. Thank you for sharing that. It's, uh, it's a great story and, and uh, lovely to share. Uh, any final remarks that you would like to make uh, to the audience uh, tonight before we wrap things up? Oh, you should have warned me about that. <laughs> uh, um, I, I don't know. I just uh, hope to be able to establish this group rapidly at OIS now. And I think it's an amazing success story. I visited actually when one had just decided to found OIST and I didn't even know exactly where it would be placed. And uh, to now see it when I visit is somehow amazing to see what has appeared in such a short time. And I think it has a great future. Well, thank you very much for that. There are uh, so many uh, comments that have come in thanking you for not only the presentation, but for detailed answers to the questions. So uh, the audience really appreciates uh, that. And there are a number of questions, as I mentioned, that we didn't get to. And for all those in the audience whose questions we didn't get to, I will uh, compile those and uh, share those with Dr. Pabo, and we will see uh, if we can get you uh, a response. Uh, let me um, take this time, you know, these webinars always go by too fast. There's so much more that we can learn, but uh, let me really thank you. Uh, this was incredibly rich and informative about uh, an absolutely fascinating topic. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to put it together and also to uh, be up early in the morning uh, to share it with us. And also, we're very excited at OIST uh, about the research that you're going to do and uh, look forward to being supportive of that and, and helping out in any way uh, possible. So thank you very much. And to the audience, uh, thank you for joining uh, this webinar. I'd like to let you know that if you go to oistfoundation.org, oistfoundation.org, uh, you can find out about other webinars coming up. Uh, the next one is October 22nd, and it will feature uh, the architect Kenneth Kornberg and Takashi Okamoto, who were the chief architects in designing OIST. Uh, and they will talk uh, a bit about not only OIST, but also how architecture impacts scientific research and the social life at institutions. So with that, I will close. 
Uh, thank you all so much, Dr. Pablo. Thank you so much. I look forward to staying in touch and truly appreciate this. Have a wonderful uh, night and for you, a uh, wonderful morning. <laughs> thank you so much.